I turn the wheel to the right and I end up accelerating into a ditch, flipping seven times, hitting a tree and flipped over a five foot fence and landed upside down in a parking lot. I literally said in that hospital bed, like, who do you want to become? You are the creator. Kia ora, hello, hello, and welcome back. This is the Let's Talk Near Death podcast, where we talk about all things life, death, spiritual experiences, experiences in between worlds, all sorts of different things. I know we're going to get into some of that today. Now, please excuse the very bland background if you're watching the video version. I'm just in the process of moving house, so yes, I have an empty bookshelf and a white wall behind me. That's okay, it should get in the way of today's conversation. Today, I'm joined by, by Cassandra Bauer, who is the founder of Now Level Up. It's a platform for holistic healing and personal transformation, and it's driven out of the experiences that Cassandra's had. She's doing amazing work following her own near-death experience and also the loss of her brother, which shows up within her near-death experience. Fascinating story. She's all about higher powers all about listening to spirit, leading our best life, living as love and showing up the best that we can in all of our moments. So Cassandra Bauer, welcome along to the Let's Talk Near Death podcast. I'm so happy to have you here. Oh my God, thank you so much for having me. How do we get into your story? Where does it kind of start? Where do we begin? The best place to start is the beginning. Helping people understand like where I really come from and and um, I guess how I became the person that's sitting here with you today, um, you know, through the near-death experience. And with you saying, you know, like, where does it start? I, I feel like the biggest thing I've learned in my life throughout this journey is that it starts from my generational trauma and from my personal trauma and my childhood trauma, which, you know, basically comes down to being raised in a family of people who had really unhealthy coping mechanisms, people who had really severe addictions, people who had real no idea how to guide a little soul in a little body in the human experience. Um, and, you know, when I came into this world, what I've gathered through my evolution and my expansion is that this has really been a coming home to feeling safe as a soul in a human body. Um, yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, that totally does. I'm just processing <laughs> that because there's a lot in just that statement there, coming home <laughs> to feeling safe within a human body. Yeah. Yeah, I, I do get it. I'd love to expand on this and just find out a little bit more of your perspective around this, but we kind of all are here feeling a bit foreign, aren't we? Oh, 100%. I think every yeah. single person you know, that I've ever met in my whole life, especially after my NDE, when you really connect in the heart, we all have that similarity that it is foreign to be here in one way or another. This is a foreign experience. Yeah. And yet it's all we know in these moments in this point of time. Yeah. Yes. So how did your experience take place? Yeah. So I guess like in a short synopsis, you know, not to go too into detail of like how I got there, but, you know, I come from a family with two brothers, Jason being my eldest, he's 10 years older than me. And Blake, uh, who's the middle child, he's three years older than me. Um, you know, throughout our, our childhood and our teens, you know, I think we all kind of struggled with this space of where do we fit in? How do we fit in? Um, and at one point or another, my eldest brother, Jason, got into drugs um, pretty early in his life. Um, I'd say like in his early teens. Um, my other brother got into drugs pretty much around the same time. Um, and then for myself, I was about I, uh, around 11 years old when um, I had been one of those kids that like witnessed everything going on. I was pretty observant as a child. And I saw that addiction was a pretty big thing in my family. Mm -hmm. And I stayed away from drugs for a long time. And when I was 11 years old, though, 
I was this very charismatic kid. I loved to make people laugh. I was, you know, this just magical little girl. Mm -hmm. And at 11 years old, I was diagnosed with ADD and ADHD. Mm -hmm. Um, And I like to say now I was misdiagnosed because to me, that drug was really something that stole my soul because I was put on it and I feel like it dimmed my light in a very big way. And because of the trauma of my family and feeling such a disconnect from everybody, there was this really intense coping mechanism between me and searching for love from my mom who distributed the pill to me Mm. and feeling like, okay, this is a point of connection, you know, so I'll surrender to it. I won't question it. I, you know, this is what, what it is. You know, I didn't ask questions. People in my family didn't ask the proper questions when I was that age. And then when I got into high school, um, I had this moment that changed my whole life where I was at the point in my life where I was distributing the drug to myself. And I decided not to take it because it suppressed my appetite. Mm -hmm. And I'm in class one day and I'm just acting like Cass, you know, loving, playing, fun, entertaining. And Mm -hmm. the two deans and my counselor ended up coming to the door, pulling me out of class and asking me if I was high and if I was on drugs. And I remember in that moment, being like, what? Like, it was this moment of like, whoa, like, I don't do drugs. I don't drink. Mm -hmm. I don't smoke pot. Like I was that person that just didn't tap into that, you know? And I remember my counselor going, did you take your Adderall? You know, like, did you take your medicine? And I was Mm -hmm. like, no, you know, like I, I, I wanted to eat lunch. That was my truth. And I remember all their faces looking at each other like, oh, that's why, you know? Mm -hmm. And I remember that moment feeling so disconnected. Like I was crazy. Like I I felt so um, just like out of my body. It was such an out-of-body experience. And that day they took me down to the nurse's office and called my mom and ended up telling her that I needed to take this pill in order to come to school. And that day I went home, I walked up to my room, closed the door, grabbed my pillow. And I remember still like the feeling of the pillow and saying out loud, no one wants me to be me. My family doesn't care who I am. They're not invested in me. They don't, you know, my teachers don't care. My counselor doesn't care. Like all these people who I thought would be invested in me, you know? and guide me in the human experience, didn't care. So it was that moment that I like consciously chose to check out of the human experience. And that moment led me down a 15 year severe pill addiction. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So. <laughs> my, sorry, my heart is just really feeling for you in that teenage place um this is such a common thing that we yeah. especially in these days um medicating you know even with that within our family we have exactly the same sort of things going on and my heart is just really breaking for the teenage Cassandra of going yeah. through this and just feeling like you want to check out and feeling like your family don't love you and aren't there for you because it's so complicated and Oh, okay. I'm going to breathe. I just, yeah, yeah, my heart is really feeling for you. Yep. Carry on. Thank you for that. Yeah. I feel like that is really important too, to shine light on that. It is really layered. You know, it's extremely layered through, Mm -hmm. you know, parents trauma through their generational trauma, through all the things they're hiding and numbing and trying to survive through and the teachers and everybody, you know what I mean? Everyone's just trying to get through, aren't we? We all we are, are. Just in there and we don't quite know half the time what we're doing. What? Yeah. Right. We wow. really okay. don't. <laughs> right. Yeah. And then as a kid, it's like you literally are in your own experience as we all are. Yeah. But it just yeah. feels like the walls are caving in and there's no reason to stay. Yeah. So 
for me, that took me down a 15 year pill addiction. So, you know, in those moments, I was just dissociating, you know, I was coping in the best ways that I could. And I was also coping in the only ways that I was taught yeah, right. around. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, um, I'm 25 years old at this point, I'm working a job that I don't like just to support my addiction. I'm in a really toxic relationship at this point. Um, and while I'm at work, I get a call from my brother, Blake, um, asking me if I could go to another room. Uh, so I go into the bathroom and I'm standing in front of this mirror and my brother says, I don't know how to tell you this, but Jason died. He overdosed. Mm -hmm. And in that moment, I just fell to my knees. Mm -hmm. And it's like the moment my knees hit the ground life, it's like my whole, my body, my soul came back into my body for the first time in 15 years. It was like, you have to be here now. And I felt and what I felt was like my heart just break. Mm. And I like to say that that part of my story was like the catalyst to me understanding my role in my own life. Because Jason was such a powerful mirror for me. You know, he was my best friend. You know, he taught me how to be an artist. He taught me how to be free in this world. He taught me how to love. He was such a gentle, loving, kind soul. And he also mirrored me, my addiction, my heart, my soul, mm. my gentleness, my tenderness. So it was a big moment, you know? Yeah, yeah. It's a big moment anyway, but with that in it, yeah. Yeah, it was a lot. Yeah. Yeah. So after Jason passed away, it was a lot of internal investigation. It was a lot of asking myself, now that I'm here, now that I'm in my body, why is it so uncomfortable? Mm. And the reason it was so uncomfortable, because now I have years and years of suppressed emotions. I have no tools. I have no guidance. I have no ability to ask anybody for help because I never had language for it. Mm. And I knew though, at the deepest part of myself, I needed to get sober. Like I knew that intuitively was my first step. So I ended up getting sober after that, but no one ever really talks about how hard it is to stay sober mm. and to understand what I call the architecture of our disease and how the disease plays tricks on you. So I got sober and between Jason's death for six months, I would drive to work every day and I would utilize my time picturing myself in a hospital bed because for me, all I wanted was love, but I didn't know any healthy ways of getting love other than like a kid who, you know, mom gives you love if you fall and you hurt yourself. My goodness, yeah. Right? Yeah. So it's like, all I knew was this like really unhealthy way of getting love. So I kept picturing myself like, well, if I'm in a hospital bed, someone will love me. Everybody oh, will love me. Goodness. Yeah. Yeah. And so six months of all my energy, all my focus going into this visualization, this realm, this picture frame of life. So fast forward six months later, I'm at a party and I end up having a drink because that's not a drug. And I never was a drinker. I get behind the wheel of a car. I'm on the highway. A car gets in my lane and I'm listening to Eminem's I'm not afraid. Oh, and okay. like, I'm just rocking out, you know, I'm not afraid. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> and, um, I turn the wheel to the right and I end up accelerating into a ditch, flipping seven times, hitting a tree and flipping over. And flipped over a five foot fence and landed upside down in a parking lot. Yeah. Oh, wow. And yet here you are right now sitting here talking yeah. to me. So there is such a reason to be here. Oh, oh. okay. Let's go. Yeah. I can't wait to hear more. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Yeah. While, well, the beautiful part too, which like 
came after was like, I heard in the back of my subconscious mind, like I'm ready to play. And it makes so much sense now with the company called Now Level Up, you know, which eventually we'll get into later. But I remember hearing that and being like, what? You know, like I'm, I'm rolling. And as I hit the first initial roll, what it turned into was me being in heaven. And when I was there, I was in a full-blown conversation with Jason and he looked at me and he told me that I wasn't alone, but I was to create a channel to allow everyone else to know that I was not alone, but I had to remember to remember that I was not alone. And I was hugging him and squeezing him and begging him not to leave me. And then I opened my arms. And when I got back here, I was in a hospital bed. Oh, yeah. It's so, the contrast is so harsh. Yeah. (laughs) Wow. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, oh my goodness, there's just so much in there. You've flipped so many times. You've gone over the ditch. You're with your brother and he's telling you, you have to remember what, how did you word it? You have to remember to remember that you're okay. Yeah. To remember, to remember that I'm not alone, which actually it like ended up being the whole key to everything in my transformation, because I like to tell people that there are ways that this could have gone right. Like I could have wake, I could have awoken to life, which I have, or I could have gone back to sleep. And I could have been like, that was just another day. It was a horrible accident. Thank God I'm alive. And I move on with my life, but I move on in the life that I was already in. Right. Mm -hmm. I don't learn much from it, but the fact that I saw him and that line, not just to create a channel for other people, right. Which I never understood until I got on my path, right. Mm -hmm. That there's something called a channel that we are the channel. Right. Mm -hmm. And But the fact that to remember, to remember you're not alone, which in every one of my 86,400 moments every day, when I'm on the floor, hysterically crying, moving through trauma, moving through generational trauma, moving through pain, moving through loneliness, moving through heartbreak, I hear him. Mm. I hear him whisper in my ear, you're not alone. You feel Mm -hmm. lonely. You feel like you are so alone in this evolution and this awakening, but you're not. Mm -hmm. And that is like my anchor point into this reality now. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. I can't help but wonder, because you said you were going along, you're listening to Eminem. You're like, right, let's play. Yeah. It's almost like you're putting out a challenge going, all right, let's do this. Let's like all or nothing. Let's go and let's truly do life. Yeah, not at all. And then just this most literally life changing moment happens. Yeah. Have you ever thought about what if you hadn't have gone to that party? What if you hadn't have had the drink? What if you hadn't have been saying to life, you know, let's do this? Yeah, a hundred percent. I've thought about it so many times. And where do you think your life would be? I really don't know. But the truth is, it's like right here, like some way, one way or another. I know that Jason, my higher power, my dad, my grandma, like wanted me to be awake, wanted and knew deep down that I would keep searching because that's what I did after Jason died. I started searching, you know, I started looking up what his name meant. I started tuning into Buddhism. I started understanding life a little bit more, but it wasn't enough. You know what I mean? I just, but I've always been this like disciplined little kid and grown up and Mm. woman where when I want to know something, I will search, I will travel, I will wander, I will get lost as many times as I have to in order to find the answer. Yep. You come across as being quite dedicated to pursuing things and (laughs) following through. And I absolutely love that because you really are making the most out of the moments, out of this experience. And yeah, I just think that's beautiful. It's amazing. So what was it like? You said you released your arms from hugging him. I hope I've got that correct. And then you were awake. Yeah. What was that like that it's such a jar, like the concepts are so different. The environments in that are so different. What was that like for you to wake up in this world? And so jarring. Yeah. It was, it was jarring in the way of 
his message saying you're not alone, but then waking up in a hospital room alone. And yeah, I'm hooked up to long? a bed, right? I'm like, okay, well, this is the first test. Like, yeah. Do you do you believe us? It's like, okay, got it. Um, but what I sat there and I realized was like we come in the world alone and we go out of it alone. And you know, when I talk to people, they're like, that's pretty like room, you know, like. And I'm like, it's actually not, it's just reality. Like even when we come through the womb, we're alone. We're essentially alone. There's people around, but we're conscious in our consciousness. We're alone. When we go out of the world, we're in our consciousness. We're alone. We're, we're having that inner dialogue with ourselves. And so I'm sitting in this bed and I'm like, what just happened? But I also, at the same point, I felt different. I felt like a different person. And I knew in that moment that the character I was playing for so long mm. was expired. I knew that she couldn't play the game the same way anymore because something stopped her. Mm. So I literally said in that hospital bed, like, who do you want to become? You know, like you can create whoever you want. It doesn't matter that you're 25 years old. Like you are the creator. Who mm. do you want to become while you're here? And then really work as it, at it. Mm. So I just sat there and I chose to become love. And I tell people all the time, like my, my transparency around that is every day I do my best to show up as her in every situation to just be that character. And that's how it works. It, has it been easy? Absolutely not. Yeah. <laughs> has it been, has it been worth it? A hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I love it. I love that we can reinvent ourselves redesign like you talk about being the creator yeah we choose how we use our moments yes it's interesting I'd like to talk on a bigger scale of that but at the moment I'm just thinking about how every little decision we make which we are capable of making we choose these things they really do create the picture of our lifestyle the backdrop of our lifestyle and who we are who we become what opportunities come before us yeah do you think in some way I'm still a little bit caught up on what if you hadn't have gone to the party. Do you think yeah. in some way we're talking about destiny and purpose and all these things? I do. Yet we're saying we can create anything. We can choose who we become. We can design our life. A hundred percent. Yeah. How much is like, it's hard to even put it into words. How do we, how much control do you think we have in purpose do you think this was always destined to happen that the other person in that role was going to be phased out so that you could step up properly was that always <laughs> going to happen I do you know I actually when people even talk to me about my brother they're like you know how do you talk about it even in the beginning years of my evolution and my awakening it was like how could you talk about it in the way that you do and it was like because I get it you know like he was such a gentle unbelievable soul but he had his own destiny and now yeah. we're partners on the other side like we are literally bridges yeah. for each other right so like cool. he, he tells me what i need to do in this world and i tell him what he needs to do in that world like we have this beautiful co-creation and he helps me to be this beautiful beacon of spirit and an advocate of spirit because if they don't have a physical voice we're their voice. And that's what yeah. I've learned in our life. And when you talk about like creating our reality, I am a big believer that when we're conscious, when we can train ourselves to be conscious in our now moment, in all those 86,400 moments, we can create the reality which we want to be in. And I love what Dr. Joe Dispenza talks about with our personality creates our personal reality. Oh yeah, definitely. See, I'm a right? big believer in all of this. Yeah. yeah. And then I think about divine appointments and about how I do believe there are moments in our life which will happen regardless. A hundred percent. But yeah, how we set up our reality is how those moments will play out as well. Yeah. So yeah, no, it's really, really interesting. Have you had any other experiences with your brother since he passed? Like, have you sensed him around have you seen him have you had other types of contact with him oh he's with me all the time like literally okay, all so the, you, do, you feel really tuned in all the time all the time yeah he is yeah. and he's like everyone in my life too knows him 
everybody in my life has like literally will call me and be like, oh my God, Jason's with me today. He's like such a protector really? of everybody so cool. who's around me. Yeah. And it's somebody asked me um, the other day, like, you know, how do you, what are some signs that he gives you that you like know it's him? Yeah. And when I first came into this reality, I was like, I had anxiety, like, you know, cause I thought I was insane in mm -hmm. this world. I was mm -hmm. like, you know, like this world doesn't talk about the unseen all the time. It doesn't talk mm -hmm. about grief a lot. It doesn't talk about spirit. It doesn't talk about this divine connection of the mind, body, spirit. Mm -hmm. And for me, that's all that I cared about when I came back was alignment. Like, mm -hmm. how do I connect to all of these things? Mm -hmm. And, um, the first day that I was like really practicing my magic, I was like, Jason, I'm like, just like, he was an amazing artist. I'm like, paint me a purple flower. Show me that I'm okay. And I turned to my right and there's a purple flower. There's no, there's no bushes. It's just a purple flower. Okay. Yeah. And I started laughing so hard. I'm like, oh, this is, this is intense. Like, this is so nutty. Right. But I can't tell you how many people I talked to where they're like, I asked for a sign today and like a bus drove by that said, this is my sign. And I doubted it. And I'm like, no, no, no. I need a better sign. You know, cause yeah, we yeah. doubt, <laughs> we yeah. literally doubt. <laughs> like now it's, it's right in front of us and we still go, oh, but that doesn't count. <laughs> exactly. Show me a different, a different yeah. way to show you that. So even like, you know, last, uh, in July, um, my partner and I went to the desert and literally comes back with a bouquet in the middle of nowhere with a bouquet of plastic purple flowers. And they're like, this was left in the bush outside. Jason wanted you to have it. And I'm like, are you kidding? And it'll oh, happen in the most boy. random fun moments, but he's so playful, but yeah. these are the little points of magic. And those are all throughout my day, all day. Oh, I absolutely love that. Even in the desert, you can find plastic flowers of all things. Right. How amazing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's really cool. Yeah. Now I can't help but ask about Blake. Yeah. How does he, does he fit into this? Um, how did you tell him? Oh, by the way, I've just been with Jason. Yeah. So actually, so my brother, he is, you know, we, I feel like our story, all of us together has been such a fairy tale. You know, we've been through such a hardship together, but it's like when you're in the hardship, it's like, you guys know, you know, there's a sacred bond because you get the trauma, you get the abuse, you get the shit you've been through. Right. So Blake has, you know, when I actually got out of the hospital, there was a couple things that I like realized was going on. One being going to the police station and them saying I was in a full-blown conversation with Jason. So that was like a big key for me. And then the second place was going to, um, whole foods with my mom and the neurologist from the hospital I just died at from a different town was in the produce aisle and I was seeing figures above her head and that day she, I actually excused myself because I started to get scared and I walked away she followed me and grabbed my arm and I turned around and she was like listen I work with people like you who have had NDEs um, she was part of IAMS and she's like, oh, I know that like, you can see my father, he died like a week or a couple of weeks ago. And I just started crying. So I'm bringing this back to Blake. Blake at the time was living on Australia and he was in this realm of like mediums and clairvoyance. And he was writing a self-help book and he was in his own oh, space beautiful. of healing. Yeah. Um, and so was his girlfriend at the time. And she was, you know, writing a kid's book and a mantra book. So they were very much in this realm. And he had been in this realm of healing for a couple of years now, for a few years. And um, I called him that night and I said, Blake, something's wrong with me. And he was like, what do you mean? And I'm like, I'm scared. I'm like seeing spirits. I'm seeing like a cowboy in my room. I'm seeing a little girl. I'm like, I feel like I'm hearing things. And I'm like, something is wrong. Like I thought something was wrong with me. I thought I was going insane. And I said, can you please reach out to one of your friends and ask them what, like any, for any guidance? Cause I didn't know anything. I didn't even know mm. how to ask for help. Mm. And he ends up calling me back and basically telling me that I needed to make a choice that I was basically teetering the line of life and death and that I can continue the way that I was continuing 
and kind of block out the magic that was coming through or the signs that were coming through. Or I could invite spirit in a healthy way and say, like, I'm ready, like guide me, like mm. show me what my path is. And I ended up moving away and moving to California and really diving into myself and studying myself and understanding myself and healing on a profound mm. level. And that's mm. like how the birth of now level up came. But my brother literally said and guided me to like, you have to make a choice. And because he was, you know, part of my life, his words meant, meant something to me. You know what I mean? Like yeah. his guidance out of everyone in my family, it's like, we were the ones left and we are the ones that are left. Yeah. Oh, I love it. I love it. And I'm really feeling right now, just just strong gratitude to Blake. It sounds weird. Yeah. I don't know the guy you've literally just talked about him just it's amazing how you're all connected but if he hadn't been doing what he was doing and really searching for his reason to be here and his healing and all these types of things he couldn't have helped you oh, 100% which brings you back to here which is just amazing now you're helping so many people yeah I love it I'd love to just tap back into your actual near-death experience yeah so you're there you're with Jason were you aware that you were dead? Like, were you like, oh, there's my dead brother? No. Were you aware of thoughts or did it just happen? What no, was it like it in the experience? Yeah, I feel like throughout the years, what I've, what I've grappled with and tried to understand is that now I'm going to go deep right now, okay? Yeah, yeah, I'm that's gonna okay. I'm really going to really go into, okay, into energy, okay? I feel like what I realized coming back here, right, is that we are a soul, we are energy, right? Mm -hmm. And emotions, right, are energy in motion. And essentially, for years and years and years, I was stuffing and suppressing my emotions, my energy into my mm -hmm. physical vessel, which felt so heavy, mm -hmm. it feels heavy to carry around sadness and pain. And oh, yeah, I was right. Like those days you just feel you're like sludge, you know, you don't yeah. want to go out of the house. You don't want to move. You don't want to talk. You don't want to engage. You don't want to connect. Yeah. And when I was there, I felt light as a feather. I felt like all of my trauma, all of my generational trauma, all of my childhood trauma, all the things that I was suppressing for years just fell away. Mm -hmm. And that I was in reality, like the real reality where we were like organically brought into this universe to be, which was like free, loving, gentle spirits and who flow, you know, like who know how to flow, who aren't like mm. have to be taught how to flow or convinced how to flow. But like, mm -hmm. I was just in flow, you know, and yeah, I feel like I was more connected in that moment that I had ever been in 25 years of my life. And it felt realer than real life. And being back, that's how I try to live my life. Yeah. Is that feeling of like, I'm in flow. I surrender. Like life's got me, you know, like yeah. the difference is like such an illusion. Yeah. You make it sound so easy. <laughs> right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Have you got any thoughts around, because I'm listening to what you're saying and it's resonating so much, but thoughts around, I don't know. I mean, it kind of sounds like for you, you've got it all figured out. You know your purpose. You know what you're doing. Yeah, you, it is difficult. I get that. But if somebody hasn't had the experience and they haven't understood why they're meant to be here, have you thought around the bigger picture of what is life all about? Why yeah. do we exist? Why are we here? Yeah. yeah. You know, it's funny you say like, you know, you got it all figured out and you know your purpose. I mean that and... very lightly. It's just. No, no, no. Yeah, I, I love like, that. Oh, do I even say that? No, I'm yeah. glad that you did. Listen, I'm a very transparent person and I love that because my truth is my moment to moment person purpose is just to be here. 
And I actually believe that's all of our purpose. And what we do is we, there's this big, like illusion and stereotype and, and expectation in this world that purpose means X, Y, and Z. Mm, mm. I am just a believer and that's why I teach it and now level up. And maybe why it even sounds so simple to me is because I actually think it is. Mm. I think like training yourself to just be in your life and understand that exactly where you are, you're meant to be and find the purpose in that moment Mm. is the ultimate purpose because most of the time we are not here. We're in the past, we're in the future, we're in anxiety, oh, we're in fear, we're in overrun, right? Yeah. It's all the things. So the training of like, if I have the ability and the energy to fear or to have anxiety, then I have the energy to have faith. And it's just a shift of perspective, but that shift of perspective is training. Like, I am the way I am because I've been literally training for years. Mm, and mm. it's like, we close this computer, we go away. I don't change because mm. I I haven't had the, like, I know um, maybe you'll, you'll understand this in a way, but I really had to understand when I came back into this world that it was not just for everyone else. It was for me. I felt right when I came back that it was for everybody else. You know, I have to create a channel to allow everyone to know that they're not alone. Yeah. Yeah. It's all about them. <laughs> yeah. And it really took it, but years, yeah. right, right. To understand that it's actually, it has to be for me. Like for, for me, like my mantra is first God, then me, then you God meeting my higher power, my divine connection to source. But if I don't find that connection every day, I get lost in the wind. Mm. Mm. Right. But purpose wise, I feel like it really does come down to understanding and surrendering into where I am right now is exactly where I'm meant to be. And it's just asking, like literally just asking, like, what is this doing for me? How is life happening for me? Not to me. And if you can really shift those tiny perspectives, it makes a whole difference in your life. Yep. Yep. No, I get it. Um, Yeah, we've had, even personally, had some pretty significant things sort of hit the fan recently. And I have been, I feel so blessed that normally I get a bit panicky and a bit stressed and freak out and go, oh my goodness, this physical experience is so crazy. And this time I've actually been able to, I mean, it hasn't been perfect, but I've been able to step back a little bit and go, this is actually just what I need to go through. This is an experience that my spirit needs to go through. So not trying to get all hung up in it and trying to change it, or I don't know if that ever makes sense, just being in it, being in things which we wouldn't have chosen, things which are difficult, which are painful. And, you know, I think there's always some good that comes out of it, like the loss of your brother would just be so, so painful, so awful. And yeah. look at the amazing stuff that's come out of it. Not to yeah. deny grief, not to say that we want to rush through grief, not to say that it's not okay to experience the pain and get really upset and feel terrible. But I kind of do believe that good stuff comes out of everything. And oh. yeah, we just need to be in these moments more, don't we? Again, we make yeah. it sound so easy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know? Yeah. If, if, you wouldn't mind, I'd love to share maybe an experience that yeah, go for maybe it. you could resonate with, but yeah. I feel, you know, yeah, my brother, the death of my brother came through for this too. But I think one of the things that actually like humbled me also the most after my awakening was the loss of my father. So my father was like my best friend, mm. but going through my near death experience and having this awakening, he was just the love of my life you know, and I never fathomed what life would look like or feel like without this character. Mm. And when he, in short, he ended up falling down the stairs and hitting his head and Mm. he ended up having brain surgery and never really recovering. So he was brain, he was bedridden for like a year and a half. And in that time, I realized so deeply staying in my moments and like feeling the gift of what 
that experience, the near death experience gave me because I didn't run. I didn't mm-hmm. dissociate. Mm-hmm. I didn't hide. I didn't numb. I was so present. It's like, I didn't get the opportunity to be there when Jason passed. That was like mm-hmm. just a shock to my system. And mm-hmm. then for another male figure in my life who was leaving my story, I ended up working on his body, sitting with him, talking to him, understanding him through a, through a nonverbal way. Mm-hmm. And when I was traveling from California to Chicago, to his to know that he was on his way out I was on the plane and I started to write on the top of my page for his eulogy and I all I could get out was how do you watch Superman hang up his cape Mm. and I ended up standing at his funeral saying as hard as this is the beauty is that I'm present to it and when I'm present to it I can also, while I'm feeling it, start to feel the twinkles of why it's happening Mm -hmm. because I'm letting my higher power show me through me, right? The channel. Mm -hmm. And the whole eulogy was about how I get to wake up every morning and look in the mirror and look to my left and see this cape that has all these memories woven in of all the lessons that he taught me and all the ways he taught me to be. And, but every morning now I get to put that cape on and look in the mirror and become the hero of my own story Mm. because he was like my balance and stability. But I think to myself all the time, could I have ever been that grounded and that, that present to his death, which was an honor. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I really, if I didn't go through that, you know, so It's like it gifted me the power of presence and not fearing, Mm -hmm. being present to my feelings, to life, right? Because when we're in the life, I'm like, I tell everybody like, I'm here to feel it, Mm -hmm. whether it's good, whether it's bad, but like, I know I'm here to feel it and it won't kill Mm me. I did Mm -hmm. that. (laughs) Did that already? I shouldn't laugh, (laughs) should I? No, I mean, it's just though. It's funny though, but it's true, you know, like- been there done that now while I'm here the best thing that I can do for myself is feel it while I'm in it yeah definitely oh yeah this really works too I think we've got to have the connection we've got to be grounded we're spirits we're having this experience but we do need to be grounded and physical as well I think we are going through these moments Yeah, yeah it's interesting to hear you talk about your father's death and just the honor to be there and the honor to go through that with him and learn from all of these things. How do you think your own experience and connecting with your brother, seeing your father's journey, how do you think that shaped or transformed the way that you look at death? I think where I'm at in this present moment The best thing that I've learned in my life thus far is loving detachment, impermanence, knowing that I heard this old proverb years ago about the hummingbird and I have her on my, on my hand and it's a, it's like a little angel with a hummingbird in front of her, like on a cloud. Can you see that? Yes. It's hard because yeah. when I talk, the video comes yeah. back to me, but oh, okay, got yeah, we got a glance of that. <laughs> yeah. So um, it's this old proverb about how like our purpose here is to be like the hummingbird because when you really watch a hummingbird, it moves so fast, but the moment it stops in front of the flower, it's fully present and it falls in love with this flower, but then it goes to the next. And it's all about that this life is like when I'm even meeting you, like right now, Kiersey, it's like for our souls to fall in love with each other, for us to be here for each other Mm. fully, Mm. and then to be able to go to our next moment and be fully present and fully in love with it, but to not get attached. So I feel like um, letting go, you know, letting go is how I think about life. It's just enjoying the ride. 
And I learned that from Jason at a very young age. That was his like tagline was like, just enjoy the job, the ride. You know, yeah. it's not about the destination. It's about the journey. And for me, it's like, um, if I, if I commit to living into each moment of my life, I will not regret the moment I have to say goodbye. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. That's really nice. That's really good. I love yeah. it. I feel like there's a couple of themes which keep coming back and we keep circling around being present. Yeah. About having these moments, about having this physical experience, about being love and just showing up in every moment. Yeah. With goodness and yeah, full attention. I can't remember the words you used for it. Here's me talking about full attention. I can't remember the word, but it was around being just completely in the moment that you're in yeah. and not worrying about the next ones, the future ones, the past ones. Let's just be and let's be engaged in what we are doing. I mm -hmm. really love it. I really love yeah. it. So let's talk about what you're doing now. You've got this amazing yeah. platform helping loads of people. Tell yeah. us a little bit about what you're doing. Yeah. So, you know, I started now level up truthfully from my own suffering you know, and understanding that in my suffering, the key was like, I felt alone. Mm. And throughout the years of helping people, I've realized just how alone we all feel. And I have dedicated myself to coining and saying that I am the perfect mirror because I do my best to be really transparent in all my moments to give people permission to just be themselves. And now Level Up focuses on the mind-body-soul connection because I'm really a believer that alignment is key. Mm -hmm. That if we are not, we don't have the body right, we don't have the mind right. We don't have the mind right, we don't have the soul right. So I work with a bunch of different modalities to align the mind, body, and soul. So I focus strongly on generational trauma where I feel like it all begins Mm. Um, I specialize in childhood regression therapy, so inner child work, oh, wow. yeah. um, but I have really honed in on parts work, which is <clears throat> a really deep modality with inner child work, focusing on parts, like fragmented parts of our childhood of like our five-year-old self, our 10-year-old self. And it's very tedious work because we have to be able to evoke them to come forward and feel safe in the container in order to do the work, right? Mm. So- the reason I start with those two modalities is because I believe that we can't really change our reality unless we pull the roots out to grow something new. And we have to go that deep. And I love going that deep and I love making it fun and making it playful. And you know what I mean? Because it can be that, you know, I've been through so much darkness that it's mm -hmm. like, I feel like the work that I do and now level up is so colorful. Like all my clients are just like, wow, this is so fun. You know, it's playful. It's nice. Yeah. And then we move into trauma informed therapy. So I do believe that trauma is really a perpetual cycle that keeps us in our imprints, our conditioning and our programming. Um, and then I work with somatic movement therapy. So little movements in the body in order to release the trauma in the physical body, mm, you know, mm. that, you know, I am a big believer that we hold the energetic weight yes, and me too. it's just, you know, yeah. parts of us that just need to let go and need to release. Um, and what I've built is a program that helps people just completely uproot their trauma and create the life from their most authentic version of self while working on the mind body soul connection because for me now level up fosters a place for radical transformation to hold and be steady for you to walk this path we call life as your authentic self not who your mom wants you to be your dad wants you to be your generational mm -hmm. trauma all these people and and society wants you mm -hmm. to be but it's about breaking free and and truthfully being a system disruptor because I am a big believer, especially now that we are in a place right now of building a conscious place for humanity. Mm -hmm. And I do believe that all the systems are blowing up right now and disrupting. And it's up to us, what I call our superheroes, to build this new earth. And in order to do that, we have to build it in alignment, you know? Mm -hmm. So you've talked a lot about uh, your working, helping people to release trauma and 
to move through, clear the system. You talked about getting the roots out and all of these beautiful works. Yeah. Do you think we can go through life sort of thinking we don't have much trauma and yet there is a lot of hidden trauma? Can we have... So can we think that actually I don't really have any childhood trauma. I I grew up in, you know, the perfect family and my life's been pretty easy. Yeah. And yet underneath there can be a whole lot of trauma that we're not even connected to. I mean, I've worked with thousands, thousands of people throughout my life. And I can't tell you how many people who have sat with me that have literally Mm -hmm. said that, that line verbatim. And my next line is then, well, then why are you here? So this is what I'm wondering. Yeah. Yeah right? So there's always an inkling coming from deep within our intuition, our higher power, something that guides you to where you're supposed to be. And I always tell people that when I started the program, I would always talk about the magic of life. And in the beginning, people were like, you know, are you a witch? You know, do you do like voodoo? And I remember (laughs) like, I was super like naive in a healthy way, but I was like, what does that even mean? You know? And I'm like, my magic is me accepting that God, our higher power is in control. Like that's what it breaks down for me. Me accepting God is in control. And if you're sitting in front of me, you stepped into the magic. You stepped into a brick that was put in front of you on your journey into the unknown. And it's up to you though, to utilize the work, to figure out what that magic really is. And I will tell you every single person who has ever come to me, and I can say every single person who has ever thought that they don't have regressed memories, childhood trauma that affected their entire life, Mm. was so blown away because our bodies are designed to hide things that we just can't cope with until we're ready to cope with it. That's why I'm all about safety and emotional safety in a container to allow those parts to come forward, to express themselves after years of hiding or numbing and escaping or being in denial, Mm. there needs to be a safe container for those parts to have permission. And I Mm. do find that everybody has that. Mm. I don't believe that there's a perfect life. I don't believe that there's no trauma. That to me is just beyond fictional. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. But again, why... Why deal with it if it's not showing up as an issue? Do you have people come to you like that? They're saying, well, I don't really feel like I need to deal with any trauma. Do we all have stuff we need to deal with? I'm, I'm a believer that we do. Yeah. I believe things have tentacles, you know, just like octopuses, like they have tentacles that run through our life. And unless you're sitting with someone who's willing to go to those depths and peel back the layers in gentle ways and be like, are you, you sure you didn't get derailed at this point because of X, Mm -hmm. Y, and Z? Mm. And people are able to sit back. And I like to say, like, when you can take radical responsibility of your life, that's when it gets really cool because then you're taking radical responsibility for your creation. Mm. I feel like that's kind of when the fun starts too. Yeah. A hundred percent. And people get like, it's crazy and it's scary, (laughs) but it's fun. (laughs) Right. I mean, I even remember in the beginning of my journey when I was like responsibility for everything. No, yeah. I'm not going to do it. Right. But yeah. then when I started to, I was like, okay, this is great because what is it going to do to me? It's just going to help me own more of my life and take more of my power back. Yeah. I yeah. love it. I think it's so great, Cassandra. Thank you. I love that we've had these reoccurring themes. It's about, you, you said right at the beginning, I chose to be love when you woke up from your near-death experience, I chose to be love and to show up every day as love. Yeah. And for me, this is just beautiful. This is exactly what it's about. We don't get a lot of what's happening here. We don't understand so much of this physical experience. And I think that's okay. But I Mm -hmm. think what we need to do is show up as love, is show up with our best intention. Be kind, be good, have goodness, be decent people and be in these moments and like you said let's just go for it let's make it exciting let's choose our path our moments create our future reality i kind of just love it all yeah there's a lot to go back and think on so i'm really grateful for our conversation today cassandra cassandra bauer thank you (laughs) so so much thank you so much it was so fun to play in the magic with you i play in it i love it it really feels like that though doesn't it yeah it really does it really does thank you so much